Hello, everyone. We're going to be talking about music and politics, which uh, is uh, a little ironic for me because the whole reason I went into music was so I could avoid politics. To me, music is the ultimate expression of our shared humanity, kissed by the divine. Uh, it's not to say that music and tribalism haven't existed, well, uh, ever since people started gathering around the bonfire. Uh, I mean, sociologists believe that playing of rhythms, singing, were the very first forms of human communication. Uh, it was the first bonding experiences uh, that helped develop hunting skills, agriculture. I mean, it's at the very core of, of our social existence as humans. Music is our universal language. You can't touch it, you can't see it, uh, and the moment we recognize it, it goes away. And yet something remains in our psyche, a sense of pure emotion. And I can look out here and I can know that there are probably a couple people who wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that sense of pure emotion that their parents or maybe grandparents uh, uh, felt when they heard Marvin Gaye singing, let's get it on. Uh, the the uh, music is also extraordinary at communicating knowledge. I mean, all of us, uh, when we're at the age of three or four, we learn 26 distinctive sounds that are at the core of our language. And we learn it so easily because we all sing it. And you all know what that song is now, and you could sing it with me. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, am I, am I right? So um, music, to be able to impart both knowledge and also emotion, it's no wonder that in religion and politics that music has been a most effective tool. Our American landscape is, is wrapped in songs and anthems that are beloved by most everyone. Uh, and yet, now in this day of uh, political polarization, uh, it pains me so deeply because a lot of our great music has become polarized as well. I'm a conductor. I have two big responsibilities. One is to the musicians in the orchestra to make sure that we perform well together. The other is to the music itself and those composers to make sure that I represent them uh, with veracity and, and good heart. Every musician in the orchestra has their single line of music. I have all the lines of music for everyone in my score. And I spend most of my time studying my score. I get that music on the written page and I hear it inside of my head. It sounds tricky, and it is. Uh, but there are some people who are extraordinary at it, like Ludwig von Beethoven, the great German composer. Uh, uh, and Beethoven spent a big chunk of his professional life stone cold deaf. And so he wasn't just recreating music in his mind, he was composing it in his mind. And I think one of the touchstones to his genius is the fact that he wasn't shackled to the physical world of sound that we all live in. He was able to imagine things that none of us could even imagine. And then he'd write it down, and then we play it, and then it blows our mind. So I have this sound in my head of uh, a given piece that I'm performing, and in a rehearsal, uh, I listen to the physical sound that comes from the orchestra. And to make things line up, I might use hand gestures to speed things up, to slow things down, to bring up the French horns, have a little less violin. Uh, but then every once in a while, a musician will come up with a certain turn of phrase, a, a certain something that will be really special. And in an instant, I'll throw out the sound that I wanted in my brain and pick up what someone has just offered. And this is the cool thing about orchestral music, is there's always this give and take as we are all working together to create a unique performance. As a pops conductor, I perform mostly American music. Uh, everything from popular classics to um, uh, Broadway, Hollywood, uh, pop tunes, and patriotic music. A lot of patriotic music, especially that first week of July. You put together a patriotic program, uh, you have a couple of Sousa marches, you'll have 
My Country, Tis of These, and Patriotic Anthems. You'll have a little big band jazz and Broadway, and you finish with the 1812 Overture. You might not recognize the title of this piece, but you know it. It's used in TV and movies. In V for Vendetta, all of London is exploding to the sound of the 1812 Overture. Ba -ba 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 yeah, it's got cannons, literally, the piece has got cannons, fireworks, church bells, and what a perfect way to end a 4th of July concert. Well, not so quick. The piece was written by a Russian composer, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. And, uh, I mean, Tchaikovsky's a brilliant composer, but it's about the Russian War of 1812, the one where they defeated the French. Well, and, I mean, it's kind of ironic because Really, if it wasn't for the French, we wouldn't be celebrating Independence Day. And uh, in the middle of this overture is this great Russian anthem, God Save the Tsar, which we're playing as we celebrate democracy. That's kind of crazy. But what's really crazy is the way that many of our American patriotic anthems seem to uh, have been co-opted by the political French. God Bless America by Irving Berlin, a Jewish immigrant, seems to now have become the anthem of the far right. Something like, this land is your land, this land is my land, uh, uh, seems to be some sort of communist manifesto. Uh, I'll, I'll put together a patriotic program and include some, uh, some R&B and soul, little funk, and people will say, mm, the program is not American enough. Well, like the 1812 overture is, or, uh, that uh, we might be considered jingoistic for performing the Armed Forces Salute. Well, even though the military did save us from worldwide fascism and abolished slavery in this country for a terrible cost. But this is not to say that all patriotic anthems are uncontroversial. I mean, I think back, I mean, this goes back for ages. Uh, like Martin Luther in the 16th century, uh, uh, the great theologian, while he was rebelling against the Catholic Church, wanted to have nothing to do with the Latin masses and chants. So instead he went to the taverns and started collecting melodies. He said, why should the devil get all the good tunes? And then he put words to the German liturgy on top of those melodies, and thus the Reformation was born. 400 years later, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did a very similar thing with the leadership of the Civil Rights Movement. And they took hymn tunes like If My Jesus Wills, composed by Louise Shropshire from Cincinnati, Ohio, and they refashioned it into We Shall Overcome. They used uh, uh, songs from folk music and pop music, everything from Bob Dylan to Aretha, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. But even some of our old-timey anthems, like uh, Yankee Doodle or The Battle Hymn of the Republic, John Brown's Body is a Moldrin in the Ground, or Helen Reddy, I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar, or Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA. These are all protest anthems. And today, uh, we have a whole new generation of composers creating protest anthems. I mean, we have Kesha and uh, the artist Common, Lady Gaga. I mean, who's to say that uh, in a generation or two, we won't be playing Childish Gambino's This Is America right next to Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. But what makes American music uniquely American, after all? A lot of people talk about the American experience as being a melting pot. I prefer a mosaic. Everyone comes here with something special and unique, and we put all of those things together, and it creates this vibrant, uh, diverse picture of our country that is so much greater than the summation of its parts. Take music, for example. The vast, vast, vast majority of American music comes from Africa. In West Africa, musical traditions that go back hundreds of years all use the same unique scale. It's called the pentatonic scale. It's got five notes. You can play it on the black keys on the keyboard. That pentatonic scale came to these shores in the belly of slave ships and buried deep in the loam of slavery and injustice. And over the centuries, there were two musical ideas that came from the earth, the spiritual 
and the blues, both based wholly upon that same pentatonic scale. Those two branches had blossoms that were cross-pollinated uh, by music from the British Isles, hymn tunes, uh, immigrant songs, uh, Native American instruments, but all by evolution or appropriation still have that musical DNA from Africa. The DNA from the music of Africa is in everything. Uh, from country, western, bluegrass, jazz, rock and roll, R&B, soul, funk, hip hop, gospel, Broadway, salsa, and Latin, this music exists because we exist. It is our American musical mosaic that is beloved around the world. It is our greatest cultural export. So how did music get caught in the political crossfires? I had the opportunity of working with Common, with the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, uh, and he told me that uh, music is a great soundtrack, but music in and of itself is not activism. Music uh, that, that inspires us and unites us and excites us has nothing to do with the politics that divides us. The music that has been used, abused, and abducted by politicians to deliver their message is in invariably the antithesis of that message. We have to separate the message from the messenger. Like Beethoven, we have to shut out the noise around us and find that inner music that we all share that's been forged by centuries of a shared experience. The good, the bad, and the ugly. In music, there's a term we use often, philharmonic. It's usually referred to an orchestra. It comes from the Greek word philos, love, harmonic, harmony. All of us on stage performing, we are lovers of harmony because we want to sound good. But there's another level, and that is the harmony that's created with audience members and the orchestra that unites us in music, that the harmony that we all have in the same space together. And then uh, another layer of harmony, the harmony that we all take with us as we go outside into the world and interact with people. This is a power of music. And in this age of COVID, we are so desperately in need of that harmony. We're going to finish things up with the Star Spangled Banner. Yep, I'm going to go there. <laughs> the melody to the Star Spangled Banner was composed by John Stafford Smith, a British composer. He wrote it at the height of the American Revolution for a British social club. It's a drinking song. Imagine during the siege of Savannah, as colonists are dying, that John Stafford Smith and his buddies are clinking glasses and singing the melody to our national anthem. It's a very difficult song to sing, and I encourage you to go check out the flub reels on YouTube. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the words were written by Francis Scott Key for our War of 1812. Well, we got that right. Uh, the first verse we all know very, very well. But there are a lot of other verses, and in those verses, some of the words are controversial at best and racist at worst. And it has only been our national anthem for the length of one lifetime. I'm going to suggest something else. America the Beautiful by Catherine Lee Bates. Here is an anthem that celebrates the fabric of our American society, not a piece of fabric. It sings about our home, our community, purple mountain majesties, fruited plains, alabaster cities gleaming. And it has the greatest patriotic lyric of them all. Crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Here's another great lyric. Um, God, mend thy every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. I mean, here's an anthem that freely admits that we are not perfect. But empowers us and impels us to do better, not just for now, but from one generation to the next and to the next. Now that is a bedrock of patriotism. Thank you.